Good morning, everybody. Today is going to be short but dense. We're going to talk about alternate splicing, which is a way to get more than one different protein from the same gene or same primary RNA transcript. We use this mechanism a lot as mammals. Uh, we have only about 25,000 protein coding genes approximately, but the fact that each one can be used in multiple ways to produce different proteins explains how diverse our proteome is compared to the number of genes we actually have. This happens really quite a lot in mammalian RNAs. Okay, we're gonna do a couple of classic examples today. One is a calcitonin and CGRP gene in human, which is spliced to form two different peptide hormones that are active in different cells. And then two Drosophila proteins, sex lethal and TRA, which govern sexual development in flies. Okay, so there are a lot of different patterns of splicing that can occur, and these illustrate some of them. Basically, anything that you can think of might happen probably does somewhere. Um, in this example, we have the mutually exclusive exons, for example, where we have a pink one and a blue one, and every primary RNA transcript is spliced such that either the pink one or the blue one is included, but not both. Sometimes you have cases where introns are actually retained. They're not spliced out in at least some versions of the primary RNA. You can also have cases where there's different five prime and three prime, three prime splice sites that are used. For example, we have the pink section of an exon where sometimes the five prime splice site is actually within the exon and sometimes it's at the other end. With the result that you will have slightly different proteins with those last few amino acids coded by the first exon, etc. So there's many different ways that you can splice or not splice to give a great diversity in your proteome. Okay, so our first example is gonna be calcitonin, which is a thyroid hormone contributing to calcium regulation. Okay, so this is actually produced ultimately by the same gene that produces the CGRP, also a hormone, this time instead of in thyroid in neuronal cells. So calcitonin splicing is regulated by a calcitonin specific splice acceptor which is activated only in thyroid cells. And you'll see a little bit more about that in a sec. Okay, so here's a diagram of the gene which encodes both of these peptides. We have exons one, two, and three, which are present in all versions of the final mature RNA. But the calcitonin is actually encoded by exon four, which is not included, it's not included in the final RNA in neurons, but is included in the thyroid. Alternatively, we have the CGRP peptide hormone exon, which is included in neurons and not in thyroid cells. So the way that works is that exon four, the calcitonin one, is flanked by weak splice sites. So it's not a good signal or it doesn't provide the proper signals really um, for the splicing apparatus to see it very regularly. So what is included in um, an intron adjacent to it is an intronic enhancer element. So what that does, of course, is to bind proteins which will facilitate recognition and usage of the adjacent splice sites. So this intronic splicing enhancer adjacent to the exon is active exclusively in thyroid cells, which is why the um, calcitonin exon is included in those cells which is not, um, CGRP is, not, is produced only in um, neuronal cells. So what they do, CGRP is not really well understood, but it does function in pain-related pathways, such as wound healing. Okay, so it's important to recognize that it's produced by the same gene that produces calcitonin, but the roles of those two peptides are completely different in cells. Here's a final picture of what the splicing looks like. The calcitonin gene includes several exons, one of which includes, uh, encodes calcitonin, and the other of which encodes CGRP. And splicing goes differently in th thyroid versus neuronal cells, such that the calcitonin coding exon is included in the final RNA in thyroid, but not in neuronal cells. And conversely, the CGRP peptide coding region is included in neurons. Now there's also alteration of the poly A sites, which we don't need to worry about right now. So those primary transcripts, of course, are then going to be translated 
that are actually processed, the final peptide hormone is processed out of the translation product to finally produce the active peptide, which have no sequence similarities to one another, another at all. Okay, so welcome to our favorite model organism, Drosophila melanogaster, which is a fruit fly. We're going to be talking about sexual development, at least some parts of the sexual development in those flies that take place in the early embryo. Okay, so Drosophila is a very important model organism. For classical genetics, a very early definition of genes and chromosomes, in fact, an understanding of biochemical pathways, etc. But it's still very popular and very important for things like developmental biology because of the high degree of conservation of developmental genes across metazoans. Very popular for neuro, um, neurobiology, especially, because the way neuro, neur neurons work and develop is a very conserved process and, and can be very informative of what happens in other organisms. Also popular in aging, evolutionary biology, behavior, etc. So what we're going to talk about is sex determination in Drosophila, which superficially looks like what we do in mammals but the me mechanisms involved are totally different, right? Flies can be males or females, XX or XY, so can we. But it's very different from ours because if you're a mammalian female, you've got two Xs, and you're a mammalian male, you have only one X. So you have to have a way to um, alter the dosage of one or the other in order to equalize the dosage between the sexes. Now, of course, in mammals, what we do is we inactivate one of the Xs in all female cells. In Drosophila, it's totally different. What they do is increase the ex expression of a single X chromosome in males. So even at the level of the dosage compensation system, the two systems are really totally different from one another. Okay, so just an overview of what this is gonna be about, where we're kind of going with this. We're gonna be talking about two genes, really. One is called sex lethal, that plays a role in sex determination. And sex lethal is a splicing repressor and its job is to guarantee that female embryos will develop as females. It's part of a complicated cascade of proteins. And the females, of, females will produce this X sex lethal protein, and male ones do not produce it for reasons that have to do with the way the initial um, pri pre pri primary RNA transcript is spliced. Okay, so here's an overview of what's going to happen. We've got XX females. Now, there's a very complicated system of events that occurs in the very, very early embryo that ensures that the XX future female embryos have a little bit of sex lethal protein to get the process going. XY males, XY male embryos do not produce that early burst of sex lethal, and so they don't ever act actually activate that gene or the female specific splicing pattern, as we will see. So here's a slightly older diagram, but I think it illustrates what we need pretty well. It does not include all the exons, just the ones under consideration for the splicing changes that occur in future females and future males. Okay, so the top part has sex lethal itself, which actually auto-regulates its own splicing. And we're only showing exons 2, 3, and 4 in this case. So sex lethal is a splicing repressor, and it binds adjacent to the third exon, and that's the one we want to exclude. Females are the active form of sex lethal, includes exons two and four, but skips exon three. Male embryos include sex lethal exons two, three, three, and four, which is to say include three, the one that is skipped in females. Well, that is important mechanistically because there's a stop codon in frame within the exon three that causes the production of a shortened protein in males which is inactive in terms of the sex lethal activity. So the splicing repressor activity of sex lethal guarantees X on three will be skipped in females or future females, whereas it will be included in males. Here's a better picture of what that looks like. We have the bi prime splice site at the end of X on two, ready to go to splice to X on three, but we've got the little blue dots that are sitting there which are binding sites for the sex lethal protein. So what happens is in early female embryos, the sex lethal protein is expressed, binds to those repressor sites. So those would be considered intronic splicing repressor sites and prevent basically 
the splicing system from recognizing that three prime splice site at the five prime end of exon three, with the result that exon three is skipped and that you get a protein which is active, which includes exons two and four. Now remember, exon three is the one that has a premature stop codon. So if you include it, you end up with an inactive protein that can't govern any other activities that sex lethal normally would do. Okay, so this is what I just said. The sex lethal binds to two sites that flank the exon, inhibits the use of the three prime splice, and the effect is that exon skipping. And as a result of this particular situation, the production of sex lethal leads to more production of itself because we're talking about the splicing of its very own transcript. Okay, summarizing what I just said, if exon 3 is included in the mRNA, you will produce a non-functional protein. So males do that because they don't have a mechanism in place to skip exon 3, which has the stop code on it. So the male form will have exons 1, 2, and 3, 1, 2, 3, and 4, but, but the um, fourth exon is not translated because of the stop code on an exon 3. In females, we exclude exon 3, and that gives us an active final mRNA, which contains all the exons except 3, and that produces the active sex lethal protein. Okay, so this is summarizing what I just said. In males, exon 2 is included, and that contains a stop codon, which you don't want because it prevents full-length TRA from being produced. So active TRA is produced only in females, and that allows the next step in the cascade, which is to say the differential splicing of the double sex transcript in males versus females to produce two different forms of this transcription factor. Here's another picture. Here's a picture of TRA again. Okay, so the sex lethal binds adjacent to that exon. It um, makes it skip that one splice site and then produces a TRA protein, which does not have the stop code on and allows um, act active protein to, protein to be made. So the action on double sex is kind of the opposite of the action on the other two, sex lethal and transformer, because the TRA is actually going to facilitate splicing. So in facilitating splicing, there's a weak splice site at the five, the three prime, and three prime splice site in exon four is weak and needs help. So the binding of TRA will facilitate the use of that um, upstream splice site in order to allow exon 4 in its entirety to be included in the final RNA. So in this case, the job of TRA is not to inhibit splicing, but rather to facilitate it by allowing the use of a weak splice site at that exon. So the ultimate effect of that is that females will include exons 3 and 4, and males will skip 4 and will include exons 3 and 5. So this produces two different forms of the double sex protein ultimately, one double sex female and the other double sex male, and both of those are active in terms of guiding further sexual development in these flies. Okay, so DSXF is a double sex female, DSXM is double sex male, and remember TRA is present in females but not males, and that's how we can produce the double sex female form of this transcription factor. So TRA facilitates the use of a three prime splice acceptor in double sex, allows exon four to be included, et cetera. So you want to have exon four um, to be skipped in males and included in females to get the two different forms of this transcription factor. Okay, now we have a few sort of clicker questions. Which of the following is a splicing repressor? Sex lethal, transformer, or double sex female? Okay, so the answer is A. Another one. Which of the following is a transcription factor? Sex lethal, tra, or double sex female? Okay, it's double sex female. Which of the following is a splicing activator? Sex lethal, tra, or double sex female? Tra. Very good. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the most amazingly most complicated example of alternative splicing in the world, and that is the DSCAM gene of Drosophila and other insects. 
It's the world's record for the most possible alternative proteins from the same pre-mRNA. Okay, so DSCAM stands for Down syndrome cell adhesion molecule. Now this protein has homologs in insects and vertebrates. And in all these organisms, it's expressed in the developing nervous system where it guides cell-to-cell -cell interactions. So for this example, we're talking about a very extreme form of alternative splicing, which can generate as many as 38,016 protein isoforms. Now this doesn't happen in mammals, although we do have the same gene. So this particular feature of this gene is not conserved in mammals, although functions, aspects of its function are certainly conserved. So here we have a representation of this gene, which is exon um, alternative splicing in the extreme. Now there are some exons that are constitutively used, namely exons 1, 2, and 3, 5, and some others. But where you see exon 4, all the little divots, exon 6, exon 9, and exon 17, those are ones where the splicing machinery has a choice to choose one example of exon 4, one of exon 6, one of nine and one of 17 in putting together the final final mRNA that's going to be translated. Now, if you do your arithmetic, exon four has 12 alternatives, 12 possible exons. Exon six has 48 possibilities. Exon nine has 33 possibilities. And exon 17 has two. So if you multiply those out, you get 12 times 48 times 33 times two is 38,000 16 possible different final RNAs that can arise from this one primary transcript. Now, I don't think it's known whether all these actually occur, although certainly a large num number of them do occur. Now, these within each exon, the choices are mutually, exclu mutually exclusive. So the splicing machinery has to choose one from the array of possibilities. So how could that possibly work? How could, what possible mechanisms could exist to allow that to, be, to work? Okay, so in this example, we're gonna be looking at an example of comparative genomics, really, comparative sequence analysis to guide us to the place where we wanna look to try to figure out what's happening. Okay, so the idea of comparative sequence analysis is if you've got a sequence like an intron, there's a lot of variation that can occur that's not selected for or against because it's basically neutral as evolution proceeds. But if you have a sequence that stays the same over long evolutionary times, it's very likely to do something important. So the people that did this study with that in mind basically took the DSCAM genes from a large variety of Drosophila species plus some others. They have two mosquitoes and they have a silk moth and then they have a beetle to basically look for regions where the nucleic acids, not, not in the protein coding region, but in the introns, are actually conserved over millions of years of evolution. And miraculously, they did come up with an astonishing degree of conservation of a particular sequence within one intron. Okay, now in the picture to the left, the little blue dot is exon 5, and then the little pink marks are all the possibilities for exon 6. And on the right, we have exon 7. So in, shown in the diagram, we have this sequence which derives from this intron between exon 5 and the very first variant of exon 6. And that region is quite seriously conserved among all these Drosophila and even including the mosquitoes, etc. So if you haven't seen this kind of representation before, what, what's shown on the bottom is a consensus sequence which reflects the most common nucleotide at each position. And they do it kind of cleverly. Each, each nucleotide has a different color, and the size of the letter indicates basically the relative frequency at which that particular nucleotide occurs. So if it's full height, like this big T is a big red, it's always T. But if you have sm smaller letters or alternatives at different positions, those are shown as smaller letters to make up the, the total. So that's a representation of this particular region between in, in the intron between exons five and six. And for reasons that will become clear in a second, we're gonna call this the docking sequence. So that's one of the conserved sequence. And I think I just said all this, the little boxes represent the possible exons. 
Okay, so this consensus sequence is going to be important in terms of figuring out what's going on. Okay, so it's an additional conserved sequence, and these are found in each of the introns that precede each possible exon. So these will be called the selector sequences. These are conserved between species and are similar to each other even within a species. So all the 48 exons, possible exons of exon 6, have a selector, selector sequence, although they're not by any means identical to each other. But there is a core consensus where we can align these as shown in the picture. Okay, so here's an example of some selector sequences. Now these possible exons are designated 6.1, 6.2, 6.3, etc., up to 48. And the little line underneath that's pointing to a place on the possible exons indicates the location of that particular sequence um, within this array of possible exons. So each of the little, we're only showing representative ones, so each little box has in fact preceding it a sequence that closely resembles the selector sequence. Okay, so here's an alignment of all the different 48 of them within Melanogaster and with the attempt to derive a consensus out of all this variation. Okay, so importantly, crucial to the mechanism really, is that there is complementarity between the docking sequence and the selector sequences as shown here. So the docking site consensus is shown in the top line. The selector consensus sequence is shown below it. And we can see that those are in fact complementary, which is hints very strongly at a mechanism whereby these particular exons can be included or not in the final RNA. Okay, so here's some examples just to illustrate the point that the selector and the docking site are complementary, but not always exactly complementary, or not ever exactly complementary. And it can span different regions with different, um, different amounts of mismatch between the particular selector and the actual docking sequence. But all will recognizably bind or are complementary to um, specific regions of the docking sequence. And this is all within, within Melanogaster here. So here's our model for how this works. We show um, possible exons. We're actually not showing the first 36. We're going to show an example where the choice of um, 6.36 is being made. And what we're seeing is the exon 5. And within the adjacent intron, we have the docking sequence. And then we're going to choose 6.36 as the exon that we're going to include out of that array. So of course, what's going to happen is the docking sequence in front of exon, potential exon 36, will line up with the docking sequence. And when that happens, that allows splicing between exon 5 and that particular version of exon 6, in this case, exon 6.36. Following that event, the exon 6, cho chosen exon 6, gets spliced to exon 5, and then that exon 5, exon 6 rather, will then be spliced to the next exon, which is exon 7, removing all the intervening RNA sequence. Similarly, the right-hand part of the slide shows the same thing with looping out of the intervening RNA to allow, in this instance, um, docking with exon 6.37 and the same splicing events to generate a different form of the final RNA. Okay, so the docking site binds to one of the selector sequences within the array. The intervening RNA loops out. Splicing occurs. And that necessarily this is going to be mutually exclusive because only one selector can bind to the docking site at once. And so following splicing, that intron is actually removed and that the constitutive exons are then attached to the variable 6.36 um, 6 in this example. Okay, so why do we need the little green oval that's shown in the picture as splicing repressors? Okay, so thinking about it, the docking selector idea explains how one and only one of the potential exon 6 can be spliced to exon 5. So 
So that clearly explains why they're mutually exclusive. You can only bind one at a time, and once it's been bound and spliced, the docking sequence is now not present in the pre-mRNA anymore. However, it does not explain why we can't then splice the exon 6 variants to each other. So the people that did this work hypothesized the existing of sp existence of splicing re re repressors that silence all those splice sites, and that would be a mechanism that has to be overcome by the docking, uh, docking and selector interaction. So this turns out to be actually true. They did, after hypothesizing its existence, they found a protein called HRP36 that seems to be the repressor, and its phenotype is that you do get exons six variants spliced to one another. Okay, so without going into any detail about how they did this, um, they picked up HRP36 as part of an RNAi screen, and what we're seeing here is again the same diagram of the DSCAM gene itself. And what we're looking at in the Western blot here, and also the um, gel electrophoresis analysis, is the untreated cells, when we PCR amplify the particular exons between 5 and 7, we see a clean band representing the splice products that includes exons 5, some version of 6, and 7. So notice those are nice, crispy, clean bands, no funny business. And notice also when we treat the cells with double-stranded RNA against HRP36, what we do, of course, is we knock down expression of that particular protein, and that the Western blot demonstrates, in fact, that that protein is greatly reduced in the presence of that RNA interference pathway. What's interesting here is when you do that, you get a bunch of extra bands. You don't just get the nice, crispy, clean PCR product that you expect from the usual one exon six product, instead you get this other stuff. So what that other stuff turns out to be is that in that mutant strain, the phenotype is that you get extra variants within your PC, within your actual pre-mRNA. So instead of just having one exon six, you can have numerous ones, all part of the same pre-mRNA. So the phenotype of this knockdown HRP36 is that, in fact, exon 6 variants can be spliced together, implying that the role of HRP36 is to pre prevent that from happening. Okay, I think I probably said most of this. Okay, notice, of course, it doesn't happen in wild-type cells. Um, one thing to think about with this, though, this type of mechanism where you have interaction between parts of the RNA that are very, very far from each other initially, this long-range interaction is not rare in reality. It's rare in the context of RNA splicing, but that sort of distal interaction between RNA and DNA sequences that are far apart in the same molecule are really very important and not rare at all in real life. And here's a practice question, um, which we won't do today, but I may, maybe we'll go over that some other time.